So I have some thoughts on Yvette Carnell's last broadcast. Not the Wednesday night, but the Monday night. She was talking about Bernie's plan to relieve student debt. And um, full disclosure, I did give to Bernie's campaign. I also gave a dollar to everybody I wanted to see in the debates. Uh, that was Tulsi and Marion Williamson, because I think Marion Williamson is the only candidate in 2020 that really cares about getting reparations. So I do have student debt, so his plan would help me as is proposed. Um, I disagreed with Yvette Carnell because I, I think um, student debt is a huge problem in America, black and white America. And I will also say she contradicts herself a lot in that presentation. So the first point she contradicts herself on was this idea that the black people that are educated have more wealth than everybody else. So the study by Sandy Darity that they keep touting says that education level doesn't close the racial wealth gap. And um, so she's tried to say in the, in the piece that the highest the people with the highest amount of wealth would be disproportionately people with educations. But previous videos she gives says that those people are boomers who got good government jobs and they were able to save up pensions and things and that's how they got the $1.4 million or the $300,000 it takes to be at the top of um, the top 1% of black America. So, also in Tone's video he did that week, he said himself he had $100,000 worth of debt. So, Tone went to UCLA, he has a popular YouTube channel, and he has a award-winning documentary. So, if Tone doesn't have a lot of net worth, the rest of us definitely don't have a lot of net worth. Uh, Yvette didn't go into how much uh, student debt she had or if she had any at all. She did, she, she, she had some debt, but she didn't say how much. So I disagree with this idea that if student loan debt is paid, it will disproportionately help black people who have more wealth. I don't have the data to back it up yet. I haven't found it, but I'd be surprised if the black people who have the highest education more than likely have a low amount of wealth because they had to take out so, many, so much money in student loans because we knew we were going into a job market that's going to discriminate against us. So that meant we went to the best schools we could get into. And often, like, she, like Yvette said on previous shows, we made sure we had an extra piece of paper. So if everyone else had bachelors, we went and made sure we had masters. If everybody had masters, we made sure we had PhDs. Because we knew we were going to a job market that's going to discriminate against us. So uh, she tried to make the case that there are all these uh, Wall Street whiz kids and uh, elite people who took out loans to go to school and now they're going to get their loans paid too. Uh, most of the wealthy people are just going to have pay their um, kids education out of pocket. So those with student debt, yes, will mostly benefit white people. And middle class white people will, will benefit more than anybody else. However, infusing black people with millions of dollars of cash and yes it will go to the most educated black people that is something and it shouldn't be poo poo what i don't like about what yvette carnell is talking about now is she basically wants to put all politics on hold until black people get reparations and i don't think that's realistic the first problem is in previous um recent broadcast she came out against hr 40 saying it was too vague and it didn't specify ADS. In previous podcasts, she also said that she couldn't vote for Bernie Sanders because he wasn't for reparations. Now, Bernie's reasons for being against reparations was he said he didn't um, understand what was asked for because different factions wanted different things. And we know that's true. Yvette Carnell had a podcast about how she wanted something different than in Cobra. And they both want something di different than like a Claude Anderson. So there are a lot of different factions that want different things. And I think Bernie is right to say that until it's decided on what needs to be done or what's wanted, he can't really act on it for or against. 
Now it's also true that he said that he would sign a bill if it passed the if it passes Congress. I think he also knows it would never pass Congress because there's not enough people in Congress that are ADOS. And I know some of you will think I'm jumping ahead of myself, but once the legislation passes and the president signs it, reparations will be challenged in the Supreme Court because there's too many people that don't want to see us get it. And the court we have now is extremely right wing. So they're talking about now they might repeal Roe v. Wade. So there's worry that Roe v. Wade's going to get repealed, which is Supreme Courts rarely ever go against previous Supreme Court decisions. Only one I can think of, I don't think I can ever think of an example offhand where they've overturned a, a Supreme Court decision other than something like, because Plessy v. Ferguson was overturned by an, a constitutional amendment. So, I mean, I don't think I can think of anything offhand. And um, so, I mean, that's something we got to think about. So, I mean, because you have to have a certain level of support from each branch of government to get something like this big through. You know, this isn't just like a tax break to pig farmers or something like that. Like, this is going to be a huge piece of legislation. Tone was talking about reparations in the trillions of dollars. So he's talking about allocating an amount of money that's, that's similar to the amount of money we spend on defense right now, $75, $750 billion in defense. He wants trillions given to ADOS black Americans. So it's going to be a small sliver of the population. And so this is a huge ask. And we don't have any of the groundwork, I feel like, ready to go in 2020. Uh, Yvette said H.R. 40 was not a good bill, so we don't have a House resolution, which is just like a mission statement. That's not a bill or anything binding. So we don't even have a House resolution uh, written up yet. Once you have that, you need a full-on bill. You need people to support it in both houses and sponsor it. And um, it's going to be hard sell to have everyone, 85% of the country agree to give a small percentage of people uh, in the country reparations. 85% I mean the non-black and non-black ADOS people to agree to this or at least a majority of them to agree to this. Like, I just don't see it happening. Even AOC said that um, she would only support reparations if it included Latino people. And everybody's going to be like that. So I, I, if we're not really shovel ready for this, we can't just say that politics is on hold for 2020 and we're not backing any candidates and we're going to withhold our vote for people who don't support something that isn't even fully defined yet by any faction, the Claude Anderson faction, the Encobra faction, or the AO, A, uh, AD, uh, ADOS faction. So, I mean, we really got to think about this because we got to get this 2020 thing off first. Now, the reason why I advocated for backing a candidate early in the previous video I did was because there is a threshold for the first and second debates, or was, for 65,000 donations. So you had to get 65,000 donations and score at least 1% on a, a recognized poll to get in the first two debates. The third debate is gonna be 130,000 donations. So if we can't get a candidate that backs reparations on that third debate, even if we get the question in the debate, everybody there is gonna be against it. So from what I can tell, the the candidates that are uh, bagging it the most are, of course, Marion Williamson. <coughs> She's been for it since the 90s. She wrote one of her spiritual books. She talked about reparations was part of American spiritual healing. Cory Booker being for baby bonds. Now, baby bonds is poo-pooed by um, Yvette Carnell. But the original baby bond study was done in 2010, authored by Sandy Darity and co-authored by Derek Hamilton. Hamilton was still getting his PhD at the time, and he is Sandy Darity's student. So Hamilton's work and his assessment is something we should take seriously. It's something we can't just dismiss it because he's coming from the same guy that we're getting all our information from. So Derek Hamilton took the baby bonds thing and ran with it, whereas Sandy Darity sees it as something that's important and part of the discussion, but it's not the full picture. 
Okay, it's not the full solution. So Sandy Darity is for baby bonds too. It's just that it's a part of a comprehensive solution for him. So Cory Booker is over here pushing for baby bonds and could actually get them through if we all put some support behind the guy and, and go for him. But that's why I'm saying we need to pick a guy so we can keep him in the race and make him viable. And then Julian Castro talks about it a lot, but I couldn't find anything where he gets concrete about what it would look like and how much money it would be. And he only started talking about it when he started to run for president to get his name in the paper, my assessment. Because I didn't hear him talking about it much before. Now, if you know it, that he's been talking about it before, post a comment, let me know, and with an article or something sourced, so I'll know from now on. But Julian Castro looks like he's just using it for political gain. But if one of those three people doesn't get in the debate, you're not going to have Biden talking about this or Bernie talking about this. And another thing I see that's going to happen, looking at it from a 2020 perspective. Now, I'm not saying that this isn't an important fight to have over many generations. I agree with that. But as far as 2020, you know, we got to look at that also. And I think that of the 2020 candidates, Bernie Sanders and Tulsi are the best two candidates. And uh, Bernie is for uh, forgiving the student debt, which I like. He's talked about guaranteed work, which is important to a group of people with high unemployment. Um, he's talked about different environmental issues. And he has a plan to help poor people. Now, granted, helping the class of the poor people won't help the racial wealth gap, but it does make being poor easier and help to stabilize our lives. I don't think it's realistic that in, t in this political climate right now, we can expect white people to give us an amount of money that will put us, put us ahead of them in the social hierarchy. I just don't see that as a realistic thing to ask for in 2020. And if we can get some of these class-based initiatives going through, it can help to stabilize our lives and keep us out here fighting. And that was Yvette Carnell's previous positions from what I gather from her old podcast. She keeps saying that, yes, you're begging for crumbs, but the crumbs are calories you can get to live. She said that on a previous uh, uh, web episode before. So now she's becoming very contradictory and she's, and I just don't think she has a good strategy for 2020. If we don't back a candidate early, because the three candidates that are really for reparations are not mainstream candidates. She said Marion Williamson was a uh, tier two candidate. Well, she's tier two because no one, because people aren't supporting her enough. If people support her, she'll be all right. That's why I gave the three candidates like that because I know there's so many people on this, uh, in this <clears throat> race right now, that I need to get a group of them that I agree with on the debate stage. Now, as it moves on, you'll decide which one you're really going to back. But even if they backed up uh, Marion Williamson right here at the beginning, if she drops out, then they'll just pivot to another candidate. It's not the end of the world. I mean, when you got 20 candidates running, if there was ever a chance to get a grassroots candidate on the stage or in the White House, this is your chance. So, I mean, just to sit back and say they have to have a position on reparations that I haven't even defined yet, or I'm not voting for them or trying to support them at all. And even if they have a part of the position I like, such as baby bonds, that Sandy Darity supports and did the original work on in 2010, Derek Hamilton did the work after 2010, but at 2010, it was Sandy Darity who came up with the idea. So to just poo-poo that and not give him any support or props, there was one episode where I say she gave him a shout out. But it's nowhere near the amount of support that he's going to need to stay in this race. If, if these guys don't hit that 130000 donation mark and they fall out of the race, especially this early, over a year ahead of the election, they're just done. Like, they're, they're probably not going to be considered for VP. Um, they're probably not going to be uh, considered for a cabinet post because they're not going to have a lot of support in the, in the public. So people are going to start forgetting about them. So, I mean, I think it's important to keep the people you think are really for reparations in the race. And, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm the only one that Mary Ann Williamson might, is the best candidate to go behind. But I think between Williamson, Booker, and Julian Castro, I think uh, we need to pick one of those guys 
Make sure you give a dollar to their campaign to keep them in the race, to make sure they keep meeting those markers so they can um, keep, uh, they can meet those markers so they can keep in these debates so we can still talk about it. So that's all I have to say.